Hi, everybody. Thanks for joining us. Um, we have residents from First Community Village, um, friends from Upper Arlington Historical Society, and others who may be watching this. Um, today, we're going to be talking about the Living Livingston Seed Company and its history um, and its connection with First Community Village. We have Melanie Brown, who's the executive director of the Upper Arlington Historical Society. And we have Martha Livingston from Livingston Seed Family, who's going to talk to us about the history of the Livingston Seed Company. So I hope you enjoy it. And I'm going to hand it over to Melanie Brown, Executive Director of the Upper Arlington Historical Society. Thank you, Meredith. Today's presentation is the second in our History Speaks 2020 series. Our first program was in March when we hosted Richard Rothstein, author of The Color of Law. I want to thank Martha Livingston for being here for our second History Speaks program in which she'll share the fascinating history of the Livingston Seed Company. And because this program was originally planned as an ice cream social at the Miller Ice House at First Community Village, we thought it still made sense to include the history of the Miller Farm, even though we're now virtual. The Upper Arlington Historical Society's History Speaks 2020 Educational Programming Series is made possible by our lead sponsor, First Merchants Bank. And also our supporting sponsors, the Centennial Veterans Committee in support of the Upper Arlington Veterans Plaza Project and the Wellington School. Our many fine sponsors, including National Church Residences and First Community Village, can be found on the Upper Arlington Historical Society website. We hope you will support these local businesses and organizations. The history of the Miller Farm begins with this gentleman, Henry Miller. Born in 1819, Henry was schooled as a medical doctor, but due to an illness, he quit that profession and built his fortune in various business ventures, including the manufacturing of boots and shoes. This is a photo of Henry's wife, Almeida. The beautiful Miller home on Broad Street was said to have had the first piano in Columbus. The Miller family was well connected. Cousins to the Millers included this gentleman, James G. Blaine, a three-term congressman and a senator from the state of Maine. Blaine also served as U.S. Secretary of State. He ran for president in 1884, losing to Grover Cleveland. The Millers were also related to this gentleman, Thomas Ewing Sr. He represented Ohio in the United States Senate. He served as the U.S. Secretary of the Treasury, and he was the first Secretary of the Interior. Incredibly, he was the father of three Union Army generals and the father-in-law of one very famous Union Army general. Thomas Ewing's daughter, Ellen, was the wife of... Union Army General William Tecumseh Sherman. Henry and Almeida Miller had five children. This is James T. Miller, their only surviving son. James was a sickly teenager and worried for his health. Henry and Almeida looked for property away from the congested city of Columbus. In 1859, Henry and Almeida Miller purchased approximately 1,000 acres of farmland in Southern Perry Township. The farm, located at the bottom of this map, was roughly bounded by today's Fifth Avenue, Riverside Drive, Lane Avenue, and North Star Road, except for some sections east of Andover Road. Henry and Almeida built this home on the property and moved into it in 1862. The gracious 20-room home had chandeliers imported from Czechoslovakia, pier glass mirrors, and white marble fireplaces. They lived there as a family until James married Esther Everett in 1869. After their marriage, James and Esther took over the farm, and Henry and Almeida returned to their home on East Broad Street. James and Esther had eight children. The first six were girls. Here he is with second daughter, Ella, the Miller daughters, Jessie, Ella, Nancy, Eliza, Almeida, and Grace, 
were very carefully reared and well-educated, attending Miss Phelps School on East Broad Street. After the six girls were born, James and Esther had two sons. The first was Henry, pictured here. The second son and youngest child was Samuel Houston, called Hugh, who served in World War I and became a medical doctor. The Millers had a full life on their farm. This photo is circa 1895. Many prominent figures visited, including Annie Oakley and Warren G. Harding. This photo of then Senator Harding with Miller daughters Jesse and Grace was taken at Scioto Country Club. The Millers had the second Pierce Arrow car in Columbus and President Woodrow Wilson rode in it in a downtown parade. On Christmas Eve, 1913, James T. Miller was joined in his home by two brothers, King and Ben Thompson. The Thompsons were real estate developers and they signed an agreement that day to purchase 840 acres of the Miller farm, which became the original part of Upper Arlington. The Miller family retained acreage around their house an area bounded by West Fifth Avenue, Riverside Drive, Waltham Road, and Upper Chelsea. This is a rendering by artist Robert McKnight of the Miller Farm. You can see the ice house and its proximity to the main house. James T. Miller was the first mayor of Upper Arlington, and this image is from the cover of the January 1918 Norwester Magazine. The Norwester Magazine was published from November 1917 to March 1922. All of the surviving issues of this early magazine can be found online at uaarchives.org. The Miller daughters were affectionately called the Aunties in the newly founded village of Upper Arlington. They, along with other village women, worked to support the Red Cross during the First World War. They were also ardent campaigners for women's suffrage and were known to march down High Street. Of the six daughters, four never married and lived all their lives in the lovely house where they were born. The two who did marry lived in homes on the Miller Farm. The ice house was filled every winter with ice cut from the Scioto River and packed in sawdust. The ice would last all summer long. The aunties would host ice cream parties for their Upper Arlington neighbors on the lawn by the ice house. In the early 1960s, after the last of the Miller children passed away, the farm was sold to First Community Church for the construction of First Community Village. In 1998, the Upper Arlington Historical Society was delighted to have the opportunity to renovate the Miller Ice House, one of the oldest structures in Upper Arlington. And if you look closely in the foreground of this photo, you can see one of the original street lights in Upper Arlington, made of poured concrete and a white globe. Now I'd like to turn the screen over to our featured guest, Martha Livingston, with her presentation about the Livingston Seed Company. First, I'd like to thank Melanie Brown and the Upper Arlington Historical Society for inviting me to speak today about the Livingston Seed Company, which is 170 years old. It's one of 10 oldest businesses in Franklin County, along with Huntington National Bank, Sheddinger Funeral Home, and Schmidt's Soft Sausage House. Hard to say quickly. Hmm. I am the great-great-granddaughter of Alexander W. Livingston, who has been credited by some as the one who developed the tomato. But actually the tomato originated in the New World with the Spanish conquestors and was cultivated in Mexico and Central America in the 16th and 17th centuries before it was introduced to the United States, first via Florida up the East Coast and then in New Orleans up the Mississippi River. And it was thought to arrive in Ohio in the early 19th century. It is, was seedy, waterous, odiferous, thick-skinned with multi-celled chambers. Many used it medicinally to cure everything it was believed from headache 
to influenza and even hepatitis. It was sold as the tomato pill, but of course later discredited as having no medicinal, medicinal value. Many collected it as ornaments and placed it on their mantle. Many also called it the Jerusalem apple or the love apple. Alexander William Livingston was born in a log, ho log house to farmer parents in Reynoldsburg, Ohio. He was one of six children. He later married Matilda Graham and together they had 10 children, seven sons and three daughters. At an early age, he collected tomatoes, using them mostly as ornaments. But one day he asked his mother, can I eat this? And she said, no, it's poisonous. And many called it also the poisonous love apple. Early in his career, he rented land from the Donovan family and began his career in farming, raising and selling livestock, growing vegetables, and experimenting with vegetable plants, which was his true love. Around the age of 30, he accumulated, accumulated enough money to buy 135 acres at Graham and Palmer Road in Reynoldsburg. At that time, seed was sold on consignment. And so there was a farmer moving to Iowa and he was able to purchase 400 seed consignment boxes. To obtain seed of any kind, the farmers either grew the vegetable or purchased it, the skin was stripped, the flesh or mush was crushed and screened, resulting in the seeds. The seeds were then put out to mold in a vat for two to three days. Then the seeds were washed over and over again because the lightweight seeds were determined to be um, non-viable and so they wanted to get them out of the mix and so when no seeds further rose to the top they were then wrung in a cotton or linen bag to get rid of the water and then they were laid out to dry while electricity and modern technology provide has provided power and resources to the process this process of obtaining the seeds is largely unchanged today in Alexander's quest for the perfect tomato, he would seek out the best varieties that he could either find or grow. He saved those seeds and planted them and looked at the results, but he didn't see much improvement. But when he looked at the row of plants, he saw a few plants that looked very different, heavy in foliage and proli had prolifically uniform round fruit. He took those seeds then, dried them, and grew them the next year and kept repeating the process. And in 1870, he introduced the first Livingston tomato commercially, which was called the Paragon. In 1848, Car Carson, uh, Harrison Crosby in Easton, Pennsylvania, developed the technique of canning. Alexander searched for tomatoes that could ripen early, wouldn't rot or crack, and survive with preservative the train transport to Pennsylvania. Heinz Tomato Company was the major um, buyer and Livingston Tomato was their major supplier. In 1904 though, the Pure Drug and Food Act resulted in the prohibition of any preservatives added to the fruit in transport so that the canners needed to look for a more local supplier. During this time, Alexander amassed 4,400 consignment boxes and he would spend the winter months traveling to see his customers from as far west as Indiana to East New Jersey, Michigan to Florida. Alexander was a um, a very uh, good churchman. And he and his family, his wife and 10 children, would be seen when he was in Reynoldsburg in church. And also with him in church were all of his employees. So it was natural for him as he traveled to seek out the local preacher. And in a letter to his cousin Hattie, he wrote that often the preacher asked him to say some words and he lectured on personal responsibility. At the end of the Civil War, 
Alexander built his home on Graham Road, and the architect and builder of the home was Nathan Orcott, who was a furniture maker, and Alexander paid extra for lumber that contained no knots. The home contains, contains seven bedrooms, a living room with a fireplace, a parlor, kitchen, and a, sun, and a summer kitchen, along with many outhouses, or outbuildings, I should say, and probably an outhouse. Um, it was the property where the building was described when it was finished as having unusually high quality with a furniture finish. Over the years, it had many owners. In fact, they added a front and side porch, moved some walls to make larger rooms. And in 19, 19, 1991, the um, Reynoldsburg City purchased the home and it was placed on the National Register of Historical Places in 2003. Currently, the property and house are maintained today by the Livingston House Society. After the Civil War, the United States and Europe had economy that was thriving and growing. But, but in 1873, there became a worldwide price deflation, which resulted in a recession. And it was called by some the Long Depression, and some even believe it lasted way longer than 1879. Many went bankrupt. In fact, there were 18,000 merchants in the United States that went bankrupt, and Alexander was found to have $20,000 in debt. He tried to work with his creditors with a plan to pay off the debt, but they refused. So he moved to Iowa with 72 cents in his pocket. He gave up the commission business and turned to selling directly to growers. And this is a picture of the first catalog published in 1879. What I think is interesting is the back cover, which has a vari various plows used to be pulled by horses to till the fields. In his later years, he returned to Columbus and wrote a book capturing what he had learned about the cultivation, processing, and consumption of tomatoes. And on the right-hand side is the cover of his recipes, there are 60 recipes. They're recipes for stewed, baked, scalloped tomatoes, tomato preserves, tomato pie, tomato custard, and tomato soy. And I've got to say, I've never tried any of them, but maybe this winter I will. Ohio was never a slave holding state, but Kentucky and West Virginia were. So slaves across the Ohio River needed help moving north thus the Underground Railroad. And Columbus was a very important part of that, having many stops on the railroad that went from Columbus east to Reynoldsburg and then on to Granville and Mount Vernon. The 19th stop on the railroad was Reynoldsburg. In fact, Alexander was, has been called the mastermind of the Reynoldsburg under, Underground Railroad. His many outbuildings and lofts could hide slaves for days. In fact, Alexander, to service his accounts, used a covered wagon in the early days. And the covered wagon was known as the Ark and had a false bottom. And one of his employees, Bob Patterson, would use the false bottom to hide the slaves and at night move them to Granville or even further north to Utica which was 34 miles away. This past July, the Reynoldsburg Police Department redid their police badge to honor the ab abolitionist history of Reynoldsburg. And you see in the lower par portion of the badge, a replica of the house, as well as his covered wagon, the Ark. Robert Livingston was the oldest um, son of Alexander and a true entrepreneur. He moved the business from Reynoldsburg to Columbus in 1880 and basically reformed it, incorporating Livingston Seed Company in 1898. He diversified the products, added two storefronts as well as a warehouse. In the left-hand picture is a picture of the warehouse and on the right is a picture of Robert. 
William McKinley, then the governor of Ohio, would come to one of the storefronts every Saturday morning early and purchase a flower for his boutonniere of the week. The business expanded, purchasing um, a fair amount of land. 100 acres of land were purchased north of Columbus, which was called True Blue Farms. Today, that would have been Kinnear Road on the south, Olentangy River Road on the east, Kenny on the west, and Lane Avenue on the north. They also purchased 200 acres of land at Kirkersville. The picture in the upper left-hand corner is the superintendent's house, which later became my grandfather's home. On the lower left-hand corner is the seed um, holding warehouse. And what's important about this picture is in the foreground is the railroad tracks. The train was really important in the early time of moving seed out to customers. And in later years, it was really important bringing seed in to be packaged. And in the, in the right hand side is the seed cleansing mill, which was capable of taking three to 4,000 bushels of tomatoes or vegetables and processing them in a day. The upper left-hand picture is a picture at um, Kinnear Road in which they had trial gardens where they would test thousands of varieties of seed each year. All of Kinnear Road was irrigated so they didn't have to rely on the weather for um, growing seed. And in the bottom right-hand corner, you'll see a variety of greenhouses which were also used. Tomatoes grew on trellises in that time and over 10,000 bushel crates of Living's to tomatoes were grown each year. The onion and crimson pepper were all grown on the Kirkersville land. And for many years, Living's and Seed Company was um, known as the larger producers, producer of fresh flowers in the area. When the canning process got um, underway, Obviously, the canneries did not require the seed and that seed was discarded from the flesh. Third party, um, it was sold to other third party um, companies who would dry the seed and sell it as their own, often undercutting the price of the Livingston seed. And so that prompted the development of the label you see on the left, which was Livingston's True Blue Seeds. And that was placed on every seed packet signifying that it indeed was from Livingston. All owners of Livingston Seed Company were very involved in the local, state, and um, national seed trade associations. In fact, they all served in leadership roles. The certificate on the right happens to be a gold medal award um, for the Yellow Supreme Marigold, which was won in 1935. In 1930s and 1940s, they transitioned large portions of production to farm seed or field crops, which was Timothy seed, alfalfa, and clover. In fact, their largest sale was eight tons of Timothy seed to Romania as part of FDR's Lend-Lease program. In 1940, all of the offices were consolidated to the Kinnear Road site. After World War II, the U.S. experienced phenomenal revitalization with changes in the workforce and urban growth. So the company transitioned from growing their own seed to partnering with seed producers. And as a result, much of the land was sold. In 1948, the first garden store opened at Strader's and of course featured Livingston seed, along with a variety of um, lines of lawn mowing equipment. Livingston seed was a major supplier of lawn and garden seed to independent retailers with accounts throughout the entire United States and much of Canada. In 1979, with my father anticipating retirement and my brother and I well-established in our own respective careers, Livingston Seed Company was sold to Plantation Products, which is a privately owned company in Norton, Massachusetts. 
whose portfolio includes most of the well-known seed and seed starting brands in North America, many of which have been established in the 1800s. For example, Ferry Morris invented selling seeds in individual packets at the time of Abraham Lincoln. And Jiffy Seed offers biodegradable planting pots made of peat, which are often used as starter um, pots for seedlings. And of course, Livingston Seed Company is their number one supplier of high quality non-GMO seed to independent businesses. In 2019, Plantation Products relocated and consolidated much of their Midwest um, operations to Columbus. As a result, they moved from the Kinnear Road site to 500,000 square foot rare warehouse facility near Rickenbacker. While the first tomato, the Paragon, was introduced in 1870, the majority of the varieties credited to Livingston were introduced after Alexander went bankrupt, with the last variety being introduced in 1930. Mike Denton was the son of a multi-generational farming family in Oregon, and he learned of Livingston and his work with the tomato, but was dismayed that so many of the varieties could no longer be found. And so after two decades of searching, growing, and matching field observations with Alexander's documentation, he re-released through his company, Victoria Seed Company, 20 of the original tomato varieties, which can all be purchased today through the Victoria Seed Company catalog. In 1965, the Franklin County Historical Society recognized Reynoldsburg as the home of the tomato. That same year, the annual Reynoldsburg Tomato Festival began and Ohio beverage was designated as tomato juice. In 2009, the tomato was named the Ohio State Fruit. For those of you watching from First Community, we have a number of connections there as well. Josiah Livingston was Robert's youngest son and he returned with him from Iowa to Columbus in 1900. He became the secretary treasurer of Livingston Seed Company and built a craftsman four square home at the corner of First Avenue and Wyandotte. And the Grandview Heights Marble Cliff Historical Society featured it on their tour of homes in 2019. Josiah, like his father, was a devout churchman and he served on the committee to establish the doctrine and creed and constitution for the new congregational church, which is now First Community Church and my home church as well. My mother lived at First Community Village in a Chelsea apartment for several years. As I interacted with her and her friends, I realized there was an opportunity to help. So after 42 years as a nurse and healthcare executive, I retired and started a small business, helping seniors downsize, with many of them moving to a retirement community. With them, we lay out the new space, figure out what to take, coordinate all the logistics, help with the packing, and in some cases do all the packing, packing and then create a warm and welcoming home with not a box in sight the day they move in. Over the last couple of years, we've been honored to help a number of residents move to First Community Village. And for me, it is truly a labor of love. So with that, I'll turn it back over to Melanie. Oops. Sorry. Okay. That is uh, the end of our History Speaks. And um, Meredith, if you would like to wrap us up. Yes, thank you. you. That was really informative. So much about the tomato and the history in Columbus, Arlington, Reynoldsburg, Grandview. I love it. So thank you everybody for watching. Thank you, Martha, for sharing your history and Melanie for inviting us and talking about Miller Farm and First Community Village and First Community Church and all the connections we have. So thank you, everybody. Thank you.